have no claustrophobic. Let's roll and take a uh, 30 seconds to get up there. Okay. Okay. Ready? Unless it breaks <laughs> down. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I haven't done that for weeks. Here we're up uh, 100 feet. Right now? Yep. Mm -hmm. Like it says right here, we're going up. That light didn't sound good. <laughs> that was fast for him. I think so. to look at, okay? So uh, he'll say, okay, let's look at NGC 861, and they will go to their computer screen, uh, they will look at the sky map, they'll find the uh, NGC 861 on there, they'll click on it, and what's going to happen is the telescope will automatically rotate to that portion of the sky where that object is. Then it will lock in on it, and then it will continue throughout the night to track it from east to west. Now at the same time, the dome will also track right along with the telescope because remember that the telescope will always have to be pointed out through that slit in the dome there. So, so they're kind of linked together. And the way they know, the way the telescope knows where the dome is, is if you look right above here, you can see all those like UPC codes up above there. Yeah, up there. So that, that gives the telescope an idea of where, uh, where it is. Mm -hmm. So this telescope is, you know, it's built like a battleship, but it's got to be as accurate as a Swiss watch, in essence. Um, now the, the two, I forgot to bring my key along, but uh, the two different orientations that are involved with this telescope are what they call 
right ascension and declination, okay? So the telescope can move in right ascension or declination. Right ascension is having the telescope move from east to west. Declination is moving the telescope north and south. Every object in the sky has an address, okay? It has a right ascension and a declination associated with it. Just like, you know, everybody's house has a street address. Well, every object in the sky has an address too. So, so when that astronomer in that control room decides to, to go to that particular object, when it clicks on that object on the map there, it, it just then knows to go to that particular right ascension and declination address. What moves here? What moves? The telescope will move. Uh, it'll move, it can move this way. The white, the white part? Right, yep. Does the only thing that moves? It moves and then, you see this big horseshoe thing here? Yeah. That, that'll move too. Like I say, you can see it over here. Uh, yeah. The white part moves this way. So that's north and south. And then this whole yoke will turn this way. It, it's resting on these two pads down here where there's high pressure oil that gets injected in there. And that, that's how it uh, uh, rotates. Um, it only takes about a quarter horsepower motor to get this whole 700,000 pound thing moving here. And once it gets moving, all you got to do is really push it by hand and it'll move. It's so finely balanced. Now, the way the observers observe, nowadays they do it from a control room because what happens is, is that usually their instrumentation is located at the bottom of the telescope and uh, that cage work there is called the Cassegrain cage and that's that's what the instrumentation guys kind of work out of you know so they can stand in there and, and put instrumentation on the bottom of the telescope I don't know if you can see it yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so all the instrumentation is right at the bottom of the telescope like the cameras and, and spectrometers or whatever whatever kind of stuff that they're using for that night and all that stuff is electronic you know, and digital and all that stuff gets fed into the control room and up on monitor screen where they look at the data. Now what's interesting about here too is nowadays it's getting to the point where the astronomer doesn't even have to be here anymore. He can what they've been doing here about a quarter of the time now is Skyping with the astronomer like he could be in he could be in uh, Tokyo or something, you know? And he can be looking at the same data and everything that the telescope operator right here is, is doing. You know? So he doesn't even have to come here anymore. Um, now, when this telescope was first uh, opened up, uh, the idea for this observatory, you know, as big and as high as it is, was a couple of things. First of all, they wanted to get it high enough off the mountain so that when the winds came over, those winds would be below it. Because if you get air movement and everything above your telescope, that's not good. You try to have very steady air above your telescope. That all helps the scene. Thing, you know? So they built it up high to be above those winds. The other thing they did the reason why it's built the way it is is because they planned on actually having the astronomers living in this building, okay? They're going to do their cooking, cleaning, sleeping, everything. So anyway, that's the way it started out. Uh, Christmas came along and all the astronomers left the building except for one. <coughs> he decided to stay here and he was going to continue doing, I'll call it imaging, but back then they were using film. Uh, so anyway, he would sit up there at the telescope, even the prime focus, way up there at the top and do his guiding and everything on an object for all night long. And uh, he went down and, and looked at his images, his stars, and I mean, they were really nice and pointy, you know, really good, you know, just like an astronomer wants. So he thought, oh, great. So he continued his work while all those other astronomers were gone and everything, and great. Then all the astronomers start coming back, okay? They move in here again, and they start doing their cooking, cleaning, and all that stuff. And the images that he started getting now were all fuzzy again. Well, these guys are pretty smart. They were able to figure out what had happened. By having all these guys move back in here, what they did was they added a little bit of heat, probably a whole bunch of humidity and moisture. And this place is like a great big chimney, you know? And it would rise right up through the building and then out of the top of the observatory dome. And that was messing up their scene. So at that point, they moved everybody out, got separate dormitories, got period. Etc. Then in like 1996 or 95, they, they cut a lot of these vents that you see just above the windows here now, all around here to, to make sure that you got a good good airflow in here, make sure that the temperature of the telescope and, and the observatory are the same as what the temperature of the outside night is going to be. You know, That's very important that you have the temperature of the telescope, telescope and air and everything at the same temperature that nighttime temperatures will be. 
Because if your telescope mirror ends up being a little warmer or something, well, in the nighttime a little cooler, well, you get some condensation, plus you get air uh, uh, currents coming up off of that telescope. That just messes up your scene and something terrible. What, what's this uh, density area? Uh, good question. What that is, is when they take the telescope mirror out, every once in a while this mirror has to be re-illuminized. You know, all, all the old aluminum take off because it's starting to go to the pot, you know? So what they'll do is they drop so it out of the telescope and they take it over here and then they take it down into the building further where, where they have this vacuum deposition chamber that I mentioned before that, right. that they end up uh, putting a new uh, layer of aluminum on the mirror. So that's what that's for. Um, okay. Any questions? Now we go down to one net for? It's just a safety net. In case somebody falls out of the cage there, or they drop a wrench or something or something that catches it. But now, like in the olden days, they would actually do their observing out of what they call the prime focus, which is right up there where the black tube is. And the way things would work then is light would come down from the star galaxy, come down, hit the big four meter mirror on the bottom of the telescope, bounce back up into what they call the prime focus, and that's where they would have their camera in that, that would, you know, photograph the image. And, and because they would have to, because film is so slow, it takes so long to, to collect an image on film, they would have to sit up there all night, and they would have to very, very closely guide that, that, that image, you know. They wouldn't want it to move around a whole lot, otherwise where the Tell us where the image is on. So they would actually have to, to physically, with a little hand control, you know, uh, uh, move the whole telescope a little bit by a little bit to keep it, you know, exactly on that star or galaxy that they were looking at. So obviously, if you need to just stay awake and you drink a lot of coffee and you drink a lot of coffee, you're going to go home. And it's always a very difficult spot to be in. <laughs> Nowadays, they don't operate that way anymore. They operate out of uh, mostly out of the cast grain focus, which is at the bottom of the telescope, and all the instrumentation is there, and all that data ends up getting collected and, 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 and observed. And, uh, there is no eye piece. Good question. Okay, any other questions on this? Just checking. What's that ladder up there for? Climb up. <laughs> All right, let's go down to the next level. I'll show you guys a few things down there, and then I'll let you go. Le monde qu'on vient de personnes qui travaillent ici en permanence. Quand je dis en permanence, qui dis même en travaillant, il y a des filles. Shouldn't get under the guy oh, that's sweating there and my trip on it. sensors and stuff and equipment that they use such as uh, uh, what's this here an infrared camera so an infrared you know, you know the camera is probably a CCD camera so that's a CCD cameras are kind of like you know the Canon or whatever you have on the phone uh, infrared means it's just going to be able to see that portion of the spectrum just beyond our ability to see infrared and uh, uh, 
So that's what that is. So we have an infrared cryogenic spectrometer. Once again, it's infrared, so it's going to see that little bit of the spectrum that our eyes just can't quite really catch. Cryogenic means it's cool. A spectrometer, that's a device that, that uh, um, splits up constituent the light of, of a star or galaxy into its constituent colors. And by looking at those, and some of the black bands and white bands that are visible in it, you can figure out a lot of things about a star or galaxy. Like, like how far away it is, how far uh, fast it might be moving, what direction it's going, how hot things are, all these other things. And the reason why it says cryogenic is because a lot of the, a lot of the uh, cameras and equipment that they use on telescopes ends up being cooled, like down to minus 150 degrees or something like that. Uh, the reason being is that, that uh, cameras in that are a lot more sensitive when they're really, really cold, for one thing. Um, a lot of the cameras, if they're, if they're doing infrared imaging, infrared uh, imaging, cameras can pick up heat real easy. So you don't want anything very warm around it. So you gotta try to cool everything off around that camera. The other nice thing about cooling uh, the uh, instrumentation, the cameras and such, is it reduces the electrical noise that those things can produce. Um, like the CCD cameras, you get what they call these hot pixels in that. Whereas, if it's at room temperature, but if you make that, that camera really, really cold, like I said, maybe 150 below or something, you don't get those little hot pixels anymore. And what creates those is this electrical noise, um, which is just electrons bouncing around. You know, if something's really hot, that means the electrons that it's made of are moving around really, really fast. That's what it means when it's hot. But if you cool something down so that it's like near absolute zero, well, then those electrons and that don't bounce around at all. And because they're not bouncing around, they're not creating noise and making little, little white dots on your CCD camera that are those stars, or is that electrical noise? You know, so, so that's why the astronomers like to cool down their cameras and spectrometers and all this other stuff. Uh, shell spectrogram, another spectrogram. I was talking about spectrographs and, and, and spectrometers and such. This is just the device that, like I said, uh, takes the color, takes the image of a star or galaxy, and it it uh, it uh, uh, um, turns it into its constituent colors, which are uh, which uh, and by looking at that and looking at the lines that are produced, you can actually determine a lot about the object that you're looking at. Um, so 